Hello everyone, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good good day, wherever you're listening, whatever time it is for you. Uh, welcome to um, our next keynote for Aussie Live 2016 and tonight we have Ben Newsom who is from Physics Education, um, a brilliant group of people who share the love of science with kindergarten or prep to year 12, people who I am very um, envious of to, to be talking science all day long. So tonight Ben's going to talk to us about teaching science globally via video conferencing uh, and all of the learning opportunities that we have there. First of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors and supporters. Um, this year we have a couple of new sponsors, Adult Learning Australia and Broadband to Seniors, um, two organi Australian organisations who support um, our older people and our adult learners, so it's brilliant to have them here. And of course the Australia E-Series, who is um, the group of people that bring you the Aussie Live Conference. We'd also like to say a big thank you to Steve Hargaden and the Learning Revolution Project for his support and allowing us to use the Blackboard Collaborate rooms and also Blackboard Collaborate for the rooms that we have here. Um, as we get started, if you could um, grab a little icon on the left hand side with your mouse um, and then um, just place your icon where approximately where you are in the world and I think we're mostly in Australia this time. It's not exactly a good time for other <laughs> time zones so most of us are in the, in the, um, in the Australian hemispheres. Brilliant. Uh, if you're on a mobile device you won't be able to to use our little icons there, so just tell us where you are in the chat. Uh, thank you, Shingo. Lovely. Okay, so um, now then, it's over to you, so you're quite welcome to start your application share, and we're looking forward to hearing all of your wonderful, interesting things. No worries. Fantastic. So we're gonna, yeah, okay, it's going to fight with our uh, JavaScript here. Okay, no problem. It's going to be one of those evenings. Can I have the extended uh, privileges? Oh, there we go. Okay, so I've got my four different windows up here, and I haven't quite got my PowerPoint thing recognized by this, which is unusual. So what we'll do, if we have to work around it, is go via websites instead. So I'm going to go on to here and share Google. Uh, ben, are you there? We've we've lost you. We can't hear you, so we might just need to. Um, uh, <laughs> he's fallen out of the room. Okay, it could be a connection issue there. Okay, we'll just give him a minute to come back in, and hopefully he'll be there. Uh, okay, so for those of you in the room, there's a we have our recording links. Uh, for those of you who are watching the recording, we also, once you've watched the recordings, we also have a um, certificate. So uh, you can request a certificate. So you can do that by going to the menu and going to Aussie Live 2016 and in the drop down there, there's a, a section for certificates. Um, there's been several really brilliant sessions so far. I got to listen to part of the keynote this morning from Julie Lindsay um, and I was uh, from what I hear from other participants, it was a brilliant presentation about connecting globally. Another um, really, uh, and some of the upcoming keynotes are also going to be um, very, very good to listen to. For example, we've got um, <coughs> um, Deanne Justin, who is an educator from Victoria. And she is going to share with us a little bit of her technology toolbox um, that we can use in our classrooms. Uh, there is also a number of other sessions being presented uh, throughout the weekend, mainly Saturday. In particular, there are, for those of you interested in um, technology and connecting with your students, hi Ben, you're back. There's a number of really great um, ideas there. 
interesting thing to the, uh, we had a power outage for about 10 seconds in our building. <laughs> do you reckon we're doomed? What do you reckon? <laughs> anyway. Uh, oh, no. Nice no, I'm not kidding you. We had a power outage. The whole building went black for 10 seconds. I'm going to have to call this. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so. We're going to try this again, and um, for those people who are very well experienced in video conferencing, anything can happen. Um, what I currently have is audio only. Uh, I have a JavaScript problem. However, I remember speaking with some schools once, and um, we were in the middle of a lesson. We had three schools at the same time, and they, um, one of the schools had a storm pass, and it knocked them out. Then the next school had a storm pass, and it knocked them out, and you could watch them falling like dominoes. <laughs> it's literally... Anything can happen, this type of thing. Now, um, we're going to try and do a share again of our, of our thing, of our, uh, of our PowerPoint. But you know what? You don't even need it when you think about it. If we have to press load slides, we might do that. But um, let's see. What do you reckon, Ness? Should we try a, a share application or shall we load the content and then talk through it why it happens? What would you like me to do? I think we, um, if we can just load the, um, it, do, just do the app share. It should be OK. Um, you just have to, but loading the slides in the background might be a good idea if you're able to do that, but I'm not sure you can, just so we can get the um, the session up and running. Yes, hello. I don't think there'll be a problem as long as your power doesn't go out again. I am there. Yeah, and you just have to remember um, to go oh, of course. Uh, relatively slowly so that it can all load for people. No problem. So I'm going to get the feedback as we do this. And I'm going to talk really slow, which those people who have met me before might find that interesting because I'm a bit excitable. <laughs> so anyway, I can see there's a yellow box around my PowerPoint. So if I click on slideshow from the beginning, we get things to work. So Thank you very much for bearing with me. We've got a lot to do tonight, and I want to make sure that we can do as much as possible to make your time worthwhile. Anyway, so um, we're going to be doing this stuff. Now, obviously, if you are into, a, into well, uh, Twitter, all these materials here will be useful. That's where I'm from. Um, I'm from physics education. Our job is to teach science all over the place in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of schools all over the country. And we've been teaching um, uh, by video conference for the last five or six years all over the world. So tell you what, if there's any problem, just call over the top if I go too fast. But really quickly, so you know, a lot of this information is being shared via Twitter, so I'm putting up a whole heap of various um, bits in there so that you can, um, you know, you can refer back to it because the last thing you need to know is, a whole, is to miss a bunch of information. But a lot of this learnings came from a fellowship I was able to pick up in 2013, which I did in 2014, traveling around North America and Canada and all those sorts of places, where I got to look at how to do science education via video conference and I went to over 25 museums and zoos and aquariums and all these places that do this really well. And so there's a very large report about what is going on in North America that, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, which could be quite useful. Now, there are a number of people here who be very well familiar about ISTE, uh, the International Society for Technology and Education. There is an interactive video conferencing network, and they have a bunch of resources which can help people out as to how, what is video conferencing, how to use it, and how might I use it in my science classroom and that sort of thing. So anyway, you'll notice we've got QR codes up there, so if you're a QR code inclined, <laughs> go for it. Now, I'm just, what I want to do with this session is give you a bunch of resources and also talk about why would you bother doing video conferencing, and then if you know what video conferencing is, well, what can you do with it to do science education? Uh, in Australia, there is a professional learning network from, which is founded with Virtual Excursions Australia, which might be a useful go-to point. So all the different museums and zoos and aquariums and places like that in Australia, seeing we have a lot of Australian people here, this is a good site to check out. Anyway, what is video conferencing? Why would you bother? Basically, what we're doing right now is a video conference using web conferencing technology, Blackboard. And uh, there's a number of other um, um, sites that you sort of check out in the top left-hand side. You can have fancy systems with really 
an impressive lighting. And, uh, you know, you can have the main speaker being shown up on a TV and a bu bunch of schools can be coming in from all different directions. That can be projected on a very large screen. Like in this case, this is at Sydney Olympic Park for the Youth uh, Eco Summit, uh, where, you know, it's basically a huge billboard. Or you could be throwing this through, and there's a bunch of different web apps that do this. You could be connecting to schools and things all over the place using iPads or a desktop computer. It's all different ways that you can talk to people. And when you can talk and show people things, all learning can happen irrespective of distance. The problem is, there's so many things to know. <laughs> I mean, when I first started out, this whole web conferencing thing was really Skype and not much else. And then there was the fancy things like blue jeans and whatnot. But the reality was that most people um, from a video conferencing point of view, so using a camera connected to a TV usually, uh, in a fancy system, either a Polycom or a Cisco system, or those people who have been around for a while might know Tamburg. There's all this stuff around, and it gets really confusing if you're like new to the game. But in reality, it's not about knowing all the fancy products, it's what do you do with them and why would you care? So, when it comes down to it, video conferencing, especially from a science point of view, is just teaching. It just happens to be that you're teaching through a camera, and they're picking up your picture, and they're picking up your audio. That's all it is. So you can see in the top left-hand corner, that little picture there, especially that little inset picture of me sort of looking there, a little bit half, half sort of frozen, like waiting for something to happen. In this case, I, I was teaching some kids remotely to run a very simple experiment on how to make a compass with a magnet and a needle and floating it on a piece of foam in, in, the, in a plate of water. Now, here's the thing. Notice that not a single person there is looking at me. I mean, a lot of the time from video conferencing point of view, people think it's a video and I have to sit there and I have to be bored. Not one kid there is looking bored because they get to do stuff. And so as you can see the title there, there are many ways of running classes from a science point of view where kids are actually going to be engaged. They could be doing a group work experiment, which you're just basically telling them, you know, describing what to do. You could have in the top right-hand corner a situation where, a, you know, in this case, we had a volunteer from Abbott's Lee trying to blow between balloons and blow them apart as a demonstration. Those people who might be, have a science background, that ain't going to happen. You cannot blow balloons apart. It's not going to happen because when you blow between the balloons, the, uh, the pressure actually lowers and air on either side of the balloons pushes inwards. Why is this useful? Well, I can instruct um, the teacher who has you know, some material set up on her own table where she can call kids up and make it interactive. You can, from a professional development point of view, like what you're doing now, a number of you are sitting here you know, taking notes and everything else for this evening. You'd be doing professional development. Now think about that. There are heaps and heaps of conferences around. And apart from the admission fee to go to conferences, and some of them can be quite high, you have to, in some cases, drive or fly there. Hotels come in, all that type of stuff cuts in, and yet if the speakers can use web conferencing or video conferencing, they can be showing whatever they're meant to be doing to teachers in the room. And sometimes you might be thinking, well, what if you wanted to show something really close? Well, if you have a second camera showing over the top of something, in this case is a classic um, experiment using Skittles, sugar, and water, it's about chemical concentrations. But if you set up an iPad or a document camera, and connect it to your system, you can have people see really close about what it is you're trying to show. So here's the point. I'm trying to show you that there are lots of ways to run science classes. So rather than this be a, here's a lot of providers that you need to connect with because they're the experts in teaching science, I bet you there's a bunch of you out there that teach science well. In fact, you know, you know I've been doing this for 20, 30 years or something. And you could easily be running your own classes or having your students teach other students you know, in the nearby state or around the world. So I want you to sort of think about how can you use some of this knowledge to, well, run it yourself. This is what doesn't work, not using it. If I could highlight that and make it flash and dance around the screen, that's the biggest thing. Um, like anything, uh, the more you use it, the more you get familiar with it. And actually, even the session at the start of this really shows you that it can be sort of you know, it can be daunting if things are going wrong. But the reality is, even when people have been doing it for a while, occasionally things might not work. So, 
the quickest way to stop things not working too much is don't try and make it too tough on yourself. Make it simple. I know that um, right now I have to slow my speech down and wait for the slides to load and all that sort of thing. So I'm not trying to make this an elaborate session. I know my camera is not linking quite well to this evening's app. It's not the app's fault. It's my computer's fault, but I'm working with it. Lighting, having bad lighting or bad sounds is important if you're going to run a science class because, well, if the kids can't see you, it's going to really not be much fun for them on the remote side. Amazingly, we have to often connect with um, schools where they have these awesome natural lighting coming in from the, you know, the side of the room or something, or worse, the back of the room. And you think about it, if you have a lot of light coming from behind you, you come up as a silhouette on the screen. No one can see what you, no one can see you. And down the bottom, which frankly, to be honest, I'm just talking at you, and it's because I am sharing a PowerPoint screen rather than having loaded slides within Collaborate, I should be answering your questions and typing back and forth to you while I talk. So really, I'm actually breaking the rule down the bottom. I'm just talking at you as opposed to interacting with you. And my way around this is I'm going to actually speed through these slides quickly so I can actually interact with you. Otherwise, you have to sit there for a very long time because it should be interesting. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of information out there. Only recently I wrote up a quick blog post. I mean, there are blogs everywhere, let's be honest. But blog posts are handy because at least you can quickly get your thoughts out. I wrote this particular blog out to help people out if you want to know how to do video conferencing simply without having to think it's difficult. And so this could be a useful site to check out. And if not, no problems at all, but that might be handy for you. Okay, so you can integrate all sorts of things into your science lessons to make them more than just a chalk and talk. These days, you can link uh, you know, iPads or Android devices to your system, and you can teach with this. Now, look at the bottom right-hand corner here. You can see green little squiggly little line here. This is a connection being done at 3 in the morning. No, trust me, I really do. I do run these, these sessions all the time to all over the world. It's crazy. And so 3 in the morning, I had these students in New York basically creating a sound which was being transmitted to me, and I was then using a free oscilloscope called Oscope Light where I could change their sound into a visual way to see their waves. And the kids could mess around with the waves, so halfway around the planet, they could see the science of sound. In the top left-hand corner, this was a uh, school, I think it was Gresford Public School up in the uh, uh, Hunter Valley in New South Wales, um, in Australia, but, you know, it was in, out, of, out of Australia. Um, these kids here um, were learning how to use their Lego robot. Now, again, notice none of them are looking at me. And in fact, if you look at the share screen, that's the share screen there, that was my screen, I'd show them how to code a particular thing. In this case, it was make this robot follow the black line. But once I showed them, they created it on their side, and then they started tinkering with it. I must admit, I sat there for 10 minutes and watched these kids work without me. And it was brilliant, because it actually showed that they were engaged and didn't need the so-called expert in the room, because they'd become the expert. And that's really the, the point of actually running lessons, is they get empowerment. They can do things. So consider when, if you want to run your own science lessons using video conferencing is integrating apps. And there's, yes, there's a blog, again, on science apps, and there's a heap. There are so many apps out there. The ones on this one, uh, these are all free. Of course, they'll have a pay gate. You know, you might have to pay a certain amount if you want to download all their lessons. But why not? Some of the best um, stuff around will be created by good developers, and you may want to use some of them. Anyway, so just check that out. It might be useful. Okay, so just imagine that you're used to running video conferencing. So you're, to, you're used to running lessons. Maybe you've got a sister school that you want to run some sessions with us. At some point in time, you may want to consider running multi-point connections. So you can see in the left-hand side screen there, we had several schools where they've been told what the ingredients are to run four slimes in 30 minutes. And literally, that's what it is, four slimes in 30 minutes. And of course, we went through the science of this, but notice in the big screen, whenever you see, this is a polycom app, this one, but notice that the big screen always is whoever is talking last. Our, our teacher here and the students, they were teaching the other kids what was happening with their slime, which is kind of neat because it gave them the chance to do some things. On this side here, on the right-hand side photo, I was running some liquid nitrogen demonstrator, demonstrations on another um, connection with multipoint. Um, in other words, lots of schools. 
How do you manage these? To be honest, all you need is a whiteboard next to your screen, your data projector or something, and just someone just simply moves really a magnet or something that says you spoke with this school, now speak with this school. You spoke with this school, now speak with this school. And that way you can keep on task. And even if you literally have four or 500 students involved, if you only have you know, eight, 10 schools, you can just cycle it through those eight, 10 places and they all get a chance to ask questions and interact. This becomes interesting. If you're looking at um, running sessions, I mean, I'm going to give examples from all over the world with this, but um, <clears throat> and I think I mentioned this in the last session I did last year for Aussie Live. Um, you can introduce games using, well, uh, Flash, and, you know, Adobe Flash and other things where you know, the kids can kind of have a bit of a game with this. In this case, I'm going to mention this one here for now. This is Royal Terrell, uh, you know, the Dinosaur Museum in Alberta, Canada. They run a fantastic program called uh, uh, Paleo Intelligence. Test your PIQ. And the idea is, I know it's off the photo here, but these dinosaurs are rushing down the side of the mountain, and this mountain happens to be a volcano. And the volcano is about to erupt. And you can get these dinosaurs to safety, to this picnic basket, only by answering questions about paleontology. And guess what? If you make it there, you win. And if you don't make it there, you get COVID in lava. Bit of fun, but it makes interaction a bit of a game. Uh, over here, this, these guys are in Long Beach. Um, this is the Aquarium in the Pacific. They were running a fantastic program, and still do, um, called Fishial Pursuit. Now, I always give total props to any place that uses puns because, you know, who, who doesn't like or, or partly not like a pun. Um, the Fishial Pursuit is basically hosted by, uh, if I remember correctly, it's a toadfish. Maybe uh, someone over there, if they're listening in LA, you might know they've done it before. It's a porcupine fish, perhaps. But it looks like a toadfish. And this toadfish is just comparing various things, you know, where, what, what's on the arm, what are the tentacles, that sort of thing. Minnesota Zoo does some great stuff as well with zoo food for thought, what eats what. Um, literacy can be brought in. So, for example, in the bottom right-hand corner, that is from Moat Marine Laboratories and in Sarasota, Florida, and they run a great session where the kids have read a book, and now they're going to do a simple game show on what were the characters in the book and, and then look at this, you know, the science behind it, which is kind of cool. This is something which I've been arguing that schools could do themselves. And it's very, very, very cool. cool. Out of Rochester, there is a Challenger Learning, Learning Discovery Center. A Ch Challenger Learning Center, I think it is. Rochester, New York. Brilliant. What these guys do is, and girls, of course, they set up just these two rooms. It's all it is beautifully set up, whereby students can pretend they're launching a spacecraft to Mars. So one room is mission control. Think of what Houston would look like if you're in NASA. Looks like mission control. And they're controlling and doing stuff. And in the other room, they are literally in a decked out spacecraft, being commanded by you know, certain things, moving a space, spacecraft here to get it into orbit, now get it to land, et cetera, et cetera. These kids all have tasks to do over the two hour period, and I have never seen such a more engaging idea to be able to run conferences just between two rooms. So even if you don't want to do remote connections outside of your school, perhaps you could have a couple of different classes set things up. I mean, these guys also set up another thing, which is the Bathysphere Underwater Biological Laboratory, where students are in this shot here. Basically, they've descended down in, into the bottom of a lake, and they're taking the samples because they're worried about who's polluting the lake. And another submersible is talking to them on the other side. And in reality, let's be honest, they're just classrooms. But wow, how good is this? So maybe you could do that type of thing in your room. Now, this is more about being occasionally in these sort of sessions, and sometimes um, museum types and places that want to um, do some things for their museums may be involved. Um, roving VC carts is not unheard of, especially a lot of schools in Victoria ha in Australia have a lot of basically video conferencing hardware set up on a cart, and they can rove it around from place to place. And that means that classes don't have to leave their room and you just got to move the equipment around. But if you've got things to show around here, like the Alaska Sea Life Center, they can bring this around their exhibits and show around the place. The New York um, 
NYSI, the New York Science Center, um, not, they, they bring it around to their exhibits, that can be done. All you need to worry about is a repeater, a Wi-Fi repeater which gives you consistent bandwidth and signal. But the reason that can be a problem is, for example, down here, Intrepid, down in New York, uh, you know, it's a World War II battleship, it has plate steel. I mean, let's be honest, it's a warship. Um, internet technology really hates trying to penetrate a metal cage. Uh, anyone with a science background knows about Faraday cages. It's really hard to get signals past them. So it caused a major issue because this is also a historical artifact. I'm not saying that you're going to have that issue in schools, but maybe think about wherever you want to take your system, it needs to be able to connect to one of these things, to your internet. And so, you know, some places will create some um, exhibits where they can send them around. So, like Marine Laboratories were sending around exhibits and into putting them into libraries, and they're putting um, video conferencing technology in there so that the library could have scheduled classes, classes with a, a, a marine expert, which is kind of cool. But, I mean, maybe perhaps you could do the similar thing. Maybe you could create your own diorama or whatever you want to call it, put it into your own science fair, perhaps, and even if it was just a, a screen, just a TV screen or just a normal computer screen, you could have someone coming in live from Mars or whatever you want to do. You could kind of create an immersive environment yourself as a, as a school teacher. The issue is, of course, you've got to have the time to actually make the thing. But it could be worth the effort. These have been around for a while. Um, and they've gotten um, fairly popular. And they're starting to arrive in Australia. Um, Video conferencing robots are interesting. Less from a science point of view, more I've just put this slide here because frankly I think they're cool. All right, so what we have here, we have a, uh, one here called a double, ro double robotics, which is basically an iPad put into a, a Segway, which can be controlled by your own iPad or computer or whatever. This one's called a QB, which is a desk-based version. And over here, oh my gosh, my brain is not working on 8.30 at night. I think these guys are going to go, what are you doing to me? You can't remember the name of my, my product. Oh dear. I'm sorry, guys, and I'm sure if this evening is being recorded, I'll have a bit of, hey, this is what it is. But I'll tell you what, I'll put it into um, some notes, and I'll put it up onto Twitter really soon. But the idea is, is that students who cannot get into your school, you know, they're bedridden at hospital, or perhaps some of them don't want to come to school because they're pregnant, and it just does happen. You can still get students to school using video conferencing robots, which can be interesting to consider. Um, from a science point of view, I know that um, some people were using this, uh, especially NYSI in New York. Um, they were using this as um, to bring students into the science clubs where they couldn't get any other kids in. But more just say, why not from a participation point of view consider this? Okay, here's the thing. If you're going to look at doing science video conferencing, you're going to want to, well, connect with people. <laughs> Could be a good idea. So here are the, some of the major places where you can go and find some friends. So starting in the top left-hand corner, collaborations around the planet, that's also known as Capspace, is, well, it's kind of like a meet place where you can post, my class is in year five. They are studying Spanish. I would like to talk to another school who is studying Spanish. And you can find people. CILC, the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration, out of Indianapolis, does the same thing. They have a classroom area where um, people can, well, meet as well. Uh, you'll find the same thing with Skype in the classroom, Google Connected Classrooms. And I, I missed the, um, the presentation earlier, but the Global Education Conference, um, you know, the Global PLN with ISTE, um, you can find places through that, people as well through there. Connect to Texas, C Share Shape is a C Share Shape is via Electra Board. That's where you'll get more more virtual video conferencing events. And especially you'll get video conferencing events through Distance and Rural Technologies, D A R T. Distance and Rural Technologies out of New South Wales. In fact, this one, Dart New South Wales, C Share Shape, and C I L C are hub spots where you can find conference content providers, museums, zoos, aquariums, that sort of thing, which could be actually interesting to do. Anyway, so there are places to go and find. And I really recommend taking a photo of this slide and checking it out at a later time. Okay, moving on. The problem is there are so many resources and it's kind of like almost overwhelming as to how many places you can check out. 
So, I mean, you can see there is a whole list of places, and uh, to be honest, if I put this on Twitter, it would basically spam everyone. Um, so I'm just sort of talking just for a little bit so the PowerPoint slide resolves itself. And I recommend taking a photo or a quick screen share, a screen snap of it, because there are so many places to go and check out where you can find, well, not just resources, also find schools and places to connect with. Let's look at the Australian situation. There are a variety of Australian uh, conference providers which you connect with or can connect with already. If you go to New South Wales Distance and Rules Technologies, so if you're typing this into Google, just type in NSW space D-A-R-T, and you'll see New South Wales uh, Distance and Rules Technologies turn up like page number one. You'll find a whole bunch of providers where there's basically a diary of all these different providers doing kind of cool, scientist stuff. In this case, the Fossil and Mineral Museum, they come out of Bathurst and they talk about, well, fossils and minerals, <laughs> funnily enough. Uh, they do a fantastic job. These guys here are interesting. Castro, you know, ARC, Center for Excellence of Excellence for Old Sky Astrophysics. Want to talk with a cosmologist? They're your friends to go talk to them. These are the university researchers. Now, I know from a science point of view, it's been very difficult for um, high school to, con to connect with other places because it's very difficult to get into the room or you know, I don't know, your period times don't line up properly with the connection or whatever. If you connect with any of these places and just say, hey, can you schedule a session for us at this time or this time or this time? You'd be fine, you'd find that most of these places would happily work around you. And when you're speaking with, for example, here, you know, world-renowned scientists every now and then, that could be worthwhile checking out. I mean, the Australian Museum will do meet the experts with their naturalists and do, you know, some great nature-based um, activities. A number of people here will be very familiar of, with Reef HQ. Reef HQ basically does a live dive into a multi-million dollar aquarium and they're rigged up so that the diver can talk to you, show you the fish, you can ask them to talk about the coral around you or whatever. It's all live and very popular and very fantastic. The only issue with this for our friends who might be overseas is you do need to work with Australian time zones because if you try and do it at, at, at night time, uh, it's dark and the aquarium's too dark, you can't see anything. So, um, yeah, yeah, you have to work around their times a bit, but it's well worth the effort. The Royal Botanic Gardens and Domain Trust, they're out of Sydney. They're doing a lot of stuff on plant-based um, video conferencing, as you could well imagine. But they are doing a bit of connections now into China, which is interesting. Sydney Olympic Park, very much about sports and nutrition, and lately around Indigenous science and Indigenous culture. Uh, could be worth checking out. And again, all of these people can be found down on Distance and Rural Technologies, New South Wales, DART New South Wales. The Australian National Maritime Museum does a great session on shipwrecks and salvage, which, you know, it can be used for um, upper high school chemistry. There are a whole bunch of environmental education centres. These guys do a lot of this. Field of Mars. They are a New South Wales public school environmental, environmental education centre, but they well kick above their weight in terms of the number of sessions they do well beyond their... Um, you know, <laughs> almost of a jurisdiction. They're leaders in doing environmental education and over video conference. Check out Field of Mars, it's worth your time. Taronga Zoo, you can come meet the animals, that's great. Uh, Manly Environment Centre, same story, they do a fantastic job around the environment and around coastal eco ecosystems. Could be interesting to check out. The Museum of Human Disease. I just like it because it's cool, let's be honest. Uh, the Museum of Human Disease is literally disease specimens. <laughs> it's the only way to describe it. If you ever get, get, get to go to the University of New South Wales, that's where they are, and they have a fantastic collection of all weird sort of oddities, and these are actually teaching specimens for their medical students. Well, great for high school biology. Questacorn, very well known. It's a national uh, science centre in, in Canberra. They do a bunch of different programs. Lately, they've been doing a bit of stuff on mission astron. Uh, Aquanautica. I'm sorry, Questacon guys, if you're listening, but I don't remember it quite exactly, but it's uh, marine and aquatic science. They're looking very much at mathematics-based programs. Could be interesting too. Okay, some people may not recognise this one because it's changed its name recently. This used to be known as the Powerhouse Museum out of Sydney. It's the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences. They're the people that have the Mars rover. So the idea is that you can connect with the Mars rover and steer it remotely from where you are. 
And so it's meant to simulate, you know, literally trying to work for NASA. Very cool. Now, the next few slides, I have done this uh, uh, in a couple other conferences prior, but, but I really want to, in our time that we've got here, give you an idea that this type of technology can really do what this title slide says, transform lives. Because there's something about this medium which speaks to students who, where other mediums just seem to not connect in some way. So the couple of next slides are really just some stories, to be honest. And, but I want you to think about maybe these could be arguments to be used in your own you know, education unit to say, hey, we should be doing more stuff like this. Okay, so the Royal Terrell Museum. Um, Megan, who's just there, was telling me a story just before I left out of Canada um, that um, they did this connection. And I, 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 I don't, it's a little bit hazy exactly what they did in my mind, so I may not get the details perfect, but here's the deal. They connect with a school down in Texas, I think, and now year three or four, I think it was year three. And so they're running these sessions, and it was all around Albertosaurus, this T-Rex dinosaur, you know, Albertosaurus, if we're going to be precise. And they're discussing about it, and this child in the room put their hand up and said, T-Rex has big teeth. And Megan said, yeah, you're right, T-Rex has big teeth. You're totally right. And they moved on. And, you know, did the, you know, did the session, closed it up, and, you know, kept on going about their day. They got an email later on from the teacher that was basically ecstatic. This child in their room had never, ever spoken before, period. Suffered from severe autism. And something about this connection, now remember, these, they, they, they had this connection. It's basically a TV where they get to talk to this person on the TV. Uh, something broke through to this year three student where suddenly this person started to speak, in school at least. And, you know, that's pretty impressive. I mean, yeah, it's great to do the science and whatnot, but there are other reasons for doing this as well. Alaska Sea Life Center had a great story. That's Darren up there. He was in this that photo. He's doing a connection on um, what it's like to live in Alaska versus these kids who are in New York at the time. Um, and the kids, you know, they, it was quite interesting. But he was describing this um, session where he was connecting with some students in Dubbo, New South Wales, Australia. So sort of, you know, think about if you had to leave the coast, you're looking about, you know, five, six hour drive from Sydney. So you're, up, you know, it's out in the country. All right, so some students he was connecting with were, um, they were kind of the struggle street students. Not, I'm, I'm talking about students who just, just never quite were able to get through school well. I guess what I'm really saying is they were dropping out. And they'd been invited in as, you know, almost like a, you know, as a mentoring program just to try and keep them in school. Hey, come speak with some people in Alaska. In Alaska, and Darren ran this session just on sea life. And he did his job well, talked about the sea, the sea life up there, all the seals and sea lions and, you know, all the stuff up there. He then gets an email from the principal at Tubbo saying, uh, we've now got kids starting to re-enroll in school. In fact, one of the kids now wants to become an, a, a marine biologist and wants to travel up to Seward up in Alaska to meet you guys and really, you know, totally turn themselves around simply by a connection that was outside of the norm. And that's the thing. Now, I know these are an hour, and I know that uh, school, school timetables can be pretty congested, but if it means you can actually re-engage students just by an hour, I bet you every one of you would use that time. So consider doing something out of the norm. It could be worthwhile. Nice eye, New York Hall of Science. I knew I was calling the wrong name. <laughs> name? New York Hall of Science. Okay, so they're running this session. This is actually, the reason why I like this one is really just about how you can just quickly do something really fast off the cuff. Okay, so now we're running a session on bubbles, basically. Bubbles and light. And, um, yeah, fair enough. In the meantime, another room was connecting using Blackboard Collaborate to some students in Kenya. And if I remember correctly, the, it was Serio Lippi in, Can in Kenya. And they were talking about microbes. And I don't know exactly how the story went, but basically one of these classes said, what else is going on in your, in, in your museum right now? And one of them said, well, this thing's happening. And so what ended up happening is that the students here got to meet the Kenyan students because they wheeled that thing into that room. And all of a sudden, you got this spontaneous learning opportunity they just wouldn't have happened in any other way. 
And so, you know, it's it's kind of it can be quite interesting if you sort of just go with it a little bit. This one's up here because it's sort of like, well, what can you do if you really want to do more than just one hour sessions? You can do project based learning. And I know project based learning is a big thing um, these days. So Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Um, Fantastic. Uh, Lily Lee Gamble, she does an awesome job. And one thing that she was showing me, apart from just the cool guy who holds the second screen, second camera, is in the top right hand corner you'll see this sort of strange white text. It's hard to read saying, yo, STD, STDs, let's teach it. What was this about? They're teaching, well, sexual health. And that is a difficult topic at the best of times to teach students. But what they had the students do was create well, songs around them, and just don't, of course, these are high school students, and you know, obviously well civilized and everything else. But they got students to create, well, raps, songs around STDs and what to do about it. And uh, you know, they shared them in a project later on, and you know, students got to watch. And this is a, a, a classic program. They, they did this one. It's called Lice Lice Baby. So again, a pun. But you know what? It's engaging, and more importantly, kids got into it. All right, moving on. Okay, so the next few slides, and I really want to dump through these pretty fast because I don't really want this to be an ad thing. But there are a bunch of different ways you can do conferencing. Ignore the fact it's got the big physics title there. Just think about all the different ways that you can do, uh, all the different things you can teach through a video conferencing medium. So you can be showing liquid nitrogen. You can be doing Lego Robotics. Now, I better slow down because I know I'm sharing my screen, so I'm going to let it resolve first. <laughs> Otherwise, Coach Carroll will say, what are you doing? Slow down. All right, so letting it, letting it sit there for me. Oh, hello. Then, then it's taking, it's actually coming through relatively okay. So uh, I know you probably can't see the chat at the moment, but there's quite a bit of chat going on. But yeah, it's coming through okay. So yeah, you're doing it. Oh, good and, and you're right. I can't see the chat. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> I, I just, just sort of like, you know, sort of talked to myself for a while. <laughs> but thanks very much. All right. So oh, great. So we'll click on through. That, that's good to know. All right, so chemistry, you obviously can do a bunch of chemistry. So actually think about this. If you've got some fancy stuff that you know a school can't see, so we've all got our chemical safety in school documents, what if you wanted to engage students to get really excited about leaving primary school to come to your high school? Why can't you show them by video conference cool stuff in your room and let the students go, wow, I so need to go to your high school next. Okay, ignoring everything, ignoring the science thing, which is clearly obvious, but some schools, they're often, they can be focused on marketing, especially independent schools. Perhaps that's another way of thinking. Electricity and magnetism. Now, I'm going to let you know that there's a one caveat in this, and as much as this photo shows this, it's not meant to be misleading. Don't show anything that's a Van de Graaff generator or a Tesla coil or anything that produces a massive electromagnetic field near your $10,000 video conference system. Um, electri <laughs> a magnet electromagnetic fields and technology tend to not play nicely together. <laughs> so I recommend if you're going to show electricity and magnetism and it's playing with some decent stuff like a Van de Graaff generator is to film it and then talk to it. So just mute the audio or something and talk to it. Show them the real materials and talk about what you're doing. But just think carefully about what it is you're going to show, how are you going to damage your room. Light and sound, I know you saw that picture here before, but um, it's actually really quite useful because you can darken your room amazingly, I mean, really well. And so you can get these effects. Like, for example, this is a red car. It doesn't show on the picture because you can't. I've got a red car where only green light shining on it. And because I've completely isolated all my light sources, and it's just a red light going onto it, a uh, green light going onto it, bear with me, I'm red, green, colour blind. Here it is. <laughs> anyway, green light's hitting that thing, and because the paint is red, it physically cannot bounce the green light back, and so it looks dark. And so you get to show this idea of colour absorption, which you may not actually be able to do in a normal classroom environment. I know it seems strange, but you actually can set up teaching environments that are better in video conferencing. Space and air pressure, you're getting the point. You can do all sorts of kind of cool stuff. 
and you know it, it goes go through quite nicely. Again, make sure you try and get volunteers up to do things. Human body, I mean, uh, yeah, we show our human body living things, things, but you can be connecting with sorts sorts of places. I'm fairly sure St. Louis was it St. Louis or St. Louis? Someone's going to tell me the the right way to say it one day, but. Out of the US, there's a teaching hospital which will literally, I'm not kidding you, you have to book ahead, but will show you cadavers. I'm not kidding you because it's still a teaching medium. And they will um, you go, through, go through literally live dissections. I'm not, it, it's amazing. Massively booked out. If you're trying to find who they are, go and look up CILC.org. Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration.org. CILC.org. And, um, just look up, just look up cadaver or something like that on their search engine, and you will be able to book your classes in for something they just would not remotely be able to have happen in any school. Yeah, there's lots of stuff to do, <laughs> to be honest. And uh, here's the point: you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of museums and things around the world who do this type of stuff. But think, think of all the tens of thousands of schools that have this technology that you can be connecting with. And so, you, it's an exciting time. There's so many things you can do. If you want to get in touch, and I have deliberately left some time to actually chat away from my slides, but if you want to get in touch, there's my email. Feel free to use it, or you know, there's enough stuff on there to help out. Uh, those people who are overseas, just put your little whatever numbers are that get you out of your country, and then type those numbers in, and you can get in touch with us too. But that's the end of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close that off. And you know what I need to do this is I go into app share, and I need to close my stop my sharing. Stop my share. Stop my share. I haven't used Blackboard for a while. Sorry, Ness and Coach Carl. <laughs> Where um, is just it? a little stop button in there. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's the one. You'd think I'd remember. Here I am trying to try to talk about video conferencing. I can't sort myself out there. But thank you very much for this. I'd love to put my video on, but every time I click on it, it has a JavaScript error going on, and we don't need me to freeze again. But we have lots and 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 lots of chat. So, um, anyone got any questions while I briefly look through some of this stuff? Well, while, while Ben's um, looking at those questions, I'd just like to point out as a primary school teacher and one who is an advocate for teaching science well in primary schools, I would recommend you go to the physics education website. Not only is there the options for uh, video conferencing, but Ben and his organisation have a bunch of experiments that you can do in your classroom that are very good, they're very well explained. Not only does it tell you how to do it, but it gives you a bit of a, an idea of why you're doing it. And I think in primary science education, there is a bit of a lack of content knowledge for teachers. So having some supportive materials that help you teach science and teach science well is really important. Yeah, I would 100% um, agree with that. And it doesn't have to be physics. I mean, I, I'll put up a link just because I probably should. Um, but just type in science experiment how. And of course, <laughs> just to be careful what you actually wish for because sometimes it may not be what you want. But I will put in the chat real fast that because that will help you out. But yes, uh, Shingo wants to ask questions. You can ask a question after the recording finishes, no problem. All right, so I've read through everything, and yes, puns are funny. <laughs> I agree. So anyone got any questions at all? What, what can I do to help you this evening? Uh, I guess I've got a question just for a general question. Um, some teachers may be worried that they don't have the capability to do video conferencing. Um, I know that first of all you probably have to check with your your techs in your schools, but then can you sort of just make sure, uh, clarify for them that um, you know you don't need any fancy equipment or what would it require for them to connect with you? Yes, thank you for that, that question. Basic requirements. I love that question. In fact, it got to the point where you know what, it was time to write something about it. Please use the link I just put up there. It's such a useful one. I know it's like, yeah, I wrote it, but it's really just how do you go about it when no one tells you what to do? <laughs> it literally is what it is. So the idea is, is that uh, how many times, seriously, there'll be people in this room who have sat through a special consultant coming in, banging on for about half a day, and you leave and you go, I don't, you've confused me, you made it worse. <laughs> you really have. To be honest, 
just get a coalition of the willing, just get one or two teachers just off to one side, and I know it sounds odd, but just turn it on. And at that point, start to sort of have a look. What I've done in that, that link is to go, righto, what can you do to start the thing up? So you turn the thing on and you see a screen. And usually, and actually, I mean, I probably could do a share screen at this point. This might be actually what, what wise, because I've got some photos here that could be handy. So let's see if I can break the system, hey? <laughs> oh, why not? Why do you not find Google? It doesn't want to. <laughs> right, we won't do that. Then. While you're trying to find Google, I, I can probably answer Carol's question there. Carol's question was, how do teachers apply to get the equipment needed? Um, well, Carol, there's always some sort of problem. Most teacher laptops will come with a, a webcam, so minimum requirement is a webcam. Um, however, uh, in some school situations, you may not be able to use that within your network, so it may require negotiations with your school tech and or, or and probably definitely your principal. So it's about talking to the people in your school that have the technological skills, if that makes sense, Carol. Yeah. You know what I'm going to do? It's going to fight me with sharing Chrome, so I'm just going to be belligerent and click on the web address thing. <laughs> and so I understand. There we go. All right, so this is what I was going on about. Drop on down here. So it's going to carry on about why you might want to do it, and I agree with what you're saying about it can be tough in your, in your places to get the fancy equipment. So my argument is don't. Just start, not with a fancy thing on that picture there. Just start with a laptop. Seriously, you can use your own iPad. There are plenty of web conferencing tools, so zoom.us. Zoom.us zoom is a good one to check out. Uh, Polycom Real Presence. I'm going to type really, really fast. Polycom Real Presence is another good one. You may want to check out Cisco Jabber. You may want to check out Google Hangouts. So Skype, web, web blah, 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 blah. can't be seen by those on mobile devices, just so you know. So there's a couple of people that can't see what you're showing. Yes, yeah, some of them can't. But for example, actually, this is what I mean. Uh, I'm a big fan of Zoom or Polycom because you can actually use all that, uh, especially Zoom, it actually it does Polycom do this. They allow you to download an app where it doesn't matter if it's an iPad, a phone, it could be a, a generally a telephone, just ringing off from a landline, a computer, a video conference system, which is in the fancy parlance, it's called H323 technology, but it's a video conference system. They all connect in one environment and off you go. So yeah, you could be waiting for your grant to give you the fancy system, but while you're waiting, let's start it using your desktop computer. And so what would you want to do? So I haven't got a, a, the ability to show my room. I'd literally happily pick up my computer and show you. It's nothing, nothing fancy. I usually have, you know, old school, a USB little plug-in thing which goes into my computer um, and Bluetooth my keyboard and my mouse so I can quickly use it and share screens and stuff. Notice I take the cover off this. I had, a set, I had a connection once where literally my batteries died. <laughs> so having that ready to go with spare batteries nearby is a useful idea. Okay, I can summarize this really fast. Just put your audio where people can hear it. And if you want to spend maybe 100 bucks or so, Polycom C100 is a useful no noise cancelling microphone um, because right now I'm going through my computer's speakers. It was just to avoid any more hassle than we had this evening. Um, but if you want to stop the background noise from your room so that the people on the other side of the planet can hear what you're saying, it's worth considering getting that thing and putting it into your desktop computer and now you can connect. Oh, next question. How do teachers gain confidence in video conferencing tools? Is that part of the peer requirements now? Interesting. Interesting. Can I throw that to the group? Are you getting this as a formal thing as PD or is it you just finding like sessions tonight to get lucky? Um, uh, technically, in my understanding is no, it's not a skill. However, um, within the curriculum requirements for teaching, uh, there are opportunities for connecting with video conferences. Um, so part of your PD, no, often you won't get that. <laughs> yeah, my argument, I've been talking with some lecturers, just to let you know I'm, I'm waving that banner for you guys right now. I believe it actually should be incorporated into the third year teaching curriculum before they leave university to become a you know, first year teacher. Uh, it would be so useful because this is a technology that's in your room. Why should you be, have to be learning it on the fly? I mean, you don't expect um, uh, you know, uh, any, a mechanic to suddenly know how to fix everything on their first year. So it should be, yeah, no, I agree. It should be part of a digital skill set. 
Okay, that was what I was talking about with the, uh, if you're doing multi-point, just get a, a literally a magnetic button and just slide it there, just have it there, and you can have someone just sliding it down and telling you which school you're dealing with. It tells about before the conference, set your presets up. Basically, it sounds a bit scary, but you've got a remote, if you've got a proper system, and just hold down numbers till it says preset set up. And um, it means that you can change your, your screen views very fast. Get used to changing your display so that you'd be amazed. You're so, you, as, a, as a conference provider, you get more used to um, talking to a mirror because in a mirror, you can see what the audience is seeing. The number of times I've, I actually can't even see the people while I'm connecting is ridiculous. That's why I'm not thrown by talking to my, my own slides. Obviously, if they need to show you something, you better get out of that view so they can show you something. So you just need to toggle your displays, and that's really, really handy. Now, I am aware we are slightly over time, so I will shush when you need me to, because do people need to go to another session? Amazing. You're the final session tonight, so <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Um, I'm Carol, the final session. Oh, yeah. Well, get the idea. Have, yeah. Yeah. Carol made an interesting point in the. Uh, oh no, Shingo made an interesting point in his grad cert in e-learning. Um, he had to run a virtual class. Um, however, in my experience in undergraduate degrees and and doing a little bit of marking for undergraduate degrees, um, there isn't as as big a focus as I would prefer, but um, I think there should be more re more reasons why teachers are, are connected with this because their expectation when they get into the classroom in, in technology is much higher than it used to be. Yeah, I agree. And here's the bottom line, it's a teaching tool. And I can highlight this. Teach like you normally do. That's all it is. It's just another medium. But I know it sounds flippant, and there might be people in the room going, oh, easy for you to say, but I only learn how to do this by doing it. It's the only way around it. So I wouldn't wait for someone to teach you. I would just have a play. Hey, you've got a bunch of people in this main room right now. Introduce yourselves and try a connection together until you're happy to do it. If you're wondering what I look like, that's me. <laughs> and I probably should show for the photo. There you go. Um, but lovely for you to come along. Again, if you want to help, uh, if you want any more help, feel free to set, drop me a line. But um, look, really appreciate for you coming along, and um, and I hope the rest of the connection through the weekend go well. I will be dropping in here and there, and I'll say hi as the different um, sessions progress over Aussie Live. Brilliant. Thanks, Ben. That last little web tour, some of it for me was flashing back and forth, so I'm not sure it was working that well, but that's okay. Thank you very much, um, Ben. I really enjoy listening to you talk your passion about education and your passion about science is really inspiring and I hope and I hope that there are other people out there who are inspired by what you're offering and what you're encouraging. So thank you very much. Might want to give Ben a little round much of applause. applause. Yay. Yeah, thank you very much. You. That's right. You've got all these buttons. That's what's cool about collaborate. You've got all this cool stuff that you can sort of play with. Yeah, all the applause buttons. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. I'll just stop the sharing there so I can flick into the last few slides. Um, before we finish up tonight, um, just a reminder of the recordings. The recordings are available afterwards. Um, pretty much almost as soon as we're finished. We've got lots of sessions happening over the weekend, particularly on Saturday. You're all welcome to join us. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from Ben again in the future. So thank you very much, Ben, and thank you, everyone, for joining us.